inclusive content strategy. We're in New Jersey, so you're at the right place. Code of conduct, I like to throw this out there for folks because we're kind of hitting the end of the day. We're going into the after party tonight. Please abide by the code of conduct. When you registered for camp, you hit a button that said you will adhere to the code of conduct. If you have any issues, Sean Walsh and his phone number, Alana took a code of conduct thing, and so she's available too if you feel more comfortable talking to her. There is a first time contributor workshop on Saturday for everybody, not just coders. So if you're in marketing, you're in sales, you do whatever, you don't code, it doesn't matter. We're gonna have a first time contributor workshop leading into uh, the code sprints. Coders are welcome too. You forgot how to write a patch, we'll show you how to write a patch. So this is me, Amy June Heinlein, and that's title camel case for the programmers out there. Um, I, Use the pronouns she and her. I am the open source community ambassador for Canopy Studios, which means I have a really neat job where I just give back to the community most of the time. So I organize and help out at local and regional camps. I help with first time contributor workshops online and at DrupalCon. I help um, in the accessibility realm, me and my friend Donna, along with some others run a virtual talk every month called Ally Talks, where we invite people in and talk about all things accessibility. And um, I'm Volkswagen Chick on all the channels. Uh, Canopy brings me here today. We're a digital open source website agency that specializes in strategy, design, support. We make websites nice. We try to work on websites that make an impact. And <coughs> there's all of you, right? Um, your project managers, your communicators, your designers, your work in content, you consume content, you help develop, you design, you're a developer, we're everybody because accessibility and inclusivity is for everybody, not just a couple of folks. And we're all skill levels, all jobs, all agencies across every platform. So what's inclusion? What's inclusion on a personal level? And then think about what inclusion is on your community level. And then there's also the sense of inclusion on a global level. And inclusion can mean different things for different folks. And um, so what we're gonna talk about specifically today is what does it mean to have an inclusive content strategy? Temple Grandin, she's a really neat person. Uh, she's an American professor of animal science in Colorado, and she's one of the first autistic people to really speak out about autism awareness. And she has this great quote that says, I'm different, not less, because differences aren't quantifiable. So I like to throw that out there, that I'm different, not less. Sometimes diversity and inclusion uh, get lumped together and are considered the same thing, but that's just not the case, right? Um, in the workplace, diversity means representation, but without the inclusion that comes along, um, the connections that attract all of those types of talent um, that encourage participation and foster creativity and lead, leads to business growth just won't be there. Diversity is focused on tracking characteristics and identities. It seeks to um, invite people who have previously been excluded um, based on all kinds of different things, gender, sexual identity, ability, age, anything that you can categorize people of. And diversity more refers to the vast array of human differences where inclusion is more about actively including those folks. So without inclusion, there's often a diversity backlash. Verna Myers is a bu public speaker, and I think this sort of sums things up really well, that diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is actually being asked to dance, not being that afterthought. Um, diversity is when you count the people, and inclusion is when the people count. And these are some numbers, because people like statistics. Um, 
why do we design for accessibility? So accessibility is essential for developers and organizations that want to create high quality websites and web tools and not exclude anybody. According to the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, 26% of all Americans live with some kind of disability. So that's roughly one in four. And in underdeveloped nations, that number is even higher. So you're looking at 26 to 35% of the population living with some sort of disability. WebAIM ran a study um, a couple years back, and they tested uh, 62 large universities, one from each state and a couple from the territories, and they found that every website had some kind of accessibility error. 78 percent of all the pages had obvious errors. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that, in that area. And DQ came out with some numbers, you know, 70% um, of sites are inaccessible, so retailers are estimated to lose 6.9 billion, and that number just went up last week. So from a profitability point of view, you're leaving a lot of your consumers behind when they can't get to your content. And they determined that two-thirds of transactions were abandoned by people who um, live with low vision. So just the folks with low vision, two-thirds people. Screen reader surveys on mobile devices found that uh, social media, which is a big platform these days, only 54% of the folks who use screen readers found uh, social media somewhat accessible. So when we design for the web and we design for responsive, we really need to make sure that we pay attention to the people who are consuming our content. So if you're working in higher ed or your platform is social media, please include mobile in your, in your uh, designs. So how do we embrace accessibility? First, we have to understand what it means. So in the context I'm going to talk about today, it's about producing rich and engaging content for everybody. For everybody, not just some people. And accessibility benefits everyone. Um, accessibility means people can readily access whatever you're offering, if it's services and venues, written content. And inclusion doesn't mean giving those folks special privileges. It, makes, it means making sure those barriers are reduced and not there. So it's not about giving special privileges. It's not about screen reader only content. It's about reducing the barriers to their entry to that content. And I'm going to do a quick run through about what accessibility is. Um, and what makes our content accessible. There's four basic parameters. Um, we make it easy to see, so we accommodate visual needs. We want to make sure that folks who have mobility issues um, can interact with our devices, so we accommodate folks' motor needs. We want to make sure that our content is easy to hear, so we accommodate auditory needs. And then we also want to make sure that our content is easy to understand, so we accommodate cognitive needs. We want to make sure that the experience is equivalent across platforms and things that we have no control over either, like what kind of um, tablet size, phone operating system, computer type, CRTs, all of those things. Meaningful content. So this is different than accessible content, right? Um, I think in this blurb, I'm not sure if I modified it for this camp, I say that inclusivity is at the heart of an effective content strategy, that accessible code is imperative um, for inclusion, but you can have all the accessible code in the world, but if your content isn't accessible, it doesn't make a difference. You know, if, you're, if your communicators go in and, and you know, break stuff, all the code in the world doesn't do any good. So we need to make sure that our content is meaningful to our readers as well, because that can leave out some folks. And who are our readers? You know, our readers are everyone. Of course, some of us have target audience, you know, we're writing technical papers and white papers and things like that. But for the most part, we write copy for everyone on the web. And meaningful content means that we don't make assumptions. Assumptions create barriers. Uh, we shouldn't assume someone's political stance when we write copy. We shouldn't assume their socioeconomic class. We shouldn't assume their abilities. Um, remember, as we get older, all of us become more disabled. Our hearing and sight deteriorate over time. And then there's situational disabilities. 
last year, bad camp or Drupal con or probably both, I had a broken arm and a busted shoulder, and I work in tech for a living. So for me, those 16 weeks, it was really hard for me to use a mouse. Didn't last forever. There's the mom on the BART, that's barrier transit, Bay Area Rapid Transit in California. There's the mom on the BART who's holding a child and has only one phone, one hand for her phone, and the video she's watching isn't closed captioned. She doesn't have her headphones. So it's sort of a situational disability because she doesn't want everyone to know what she's listening to on the BART. It could be a privacy issue, you know? Um, there's people on the plane, same sort of thing, that didn't bring their headphones, but we're covering from Lasix. And then um, we need to remember that not every disability can be seen. There's those hidden disabilities like chronic fatigue and chronic pain, the cognitive disabilities, um, people who live with hearing and vision loss. And then other common assumptions that folks make um, are around someone's gender identity sexuality and preferred pronouns. Um, so even using phrases like man hours or man the booth can leave some people out of the conversation. So we're going to look a little bit at inclusive language before we move into accessibility. Um, increasing the inclusivity of our language means striving to understand the way that um, the ways that languages unconsciously makes assumptions about folks. It can unintentionally reinforce the dominant norms around gender or ability or race or class and other identities and experiences. So again, language can unintentionally reinforce dominant norms, and that's important. Ableist language. Um, ableist language is any word or phrase that values people who live with disabilities. Um, they're mostly inadvertent, right? Um, maybe we just don't know what ableist language is. But it often suggests that people with disabilities are abnormal. So we want to make sure that we use language that folks prefer to use. Um, even the term disability sometimes isn't regarded within the disability community. So if you're addressing a community, make sure you use terms that they would like to be called. Um, we should use personal, person-centered language. Um, like instead of saying the disabled, we say people who live with disabilities. Um, we should avoid negative and demeaning language. Um, like instead of victims of AIDS, AIDS victims, we say folks who live with, with AIDS. Um, instead of wheelchair bound, we say people who use wheelchairs. Um, it's become rather, un rather common to use phrases in the workplace like crazy, dumb, or lame. Um, Terms like crazy and insane kind of make light of mental illness in a way that allies really don't want to, you know, we don't want to make fun of those sort of things. OCD is one that we use a lot in our community, I notice, and OCD is, um, can be hurtful when used, when misused. Um, it's obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's a mental illness that means so much more than just a knack for organization. It's an obstacle that some people live with every day, um, and using using it sort of devalues their experience. You know, so make sure we use words like organized or clean. There's always a substitute for those words. Another aspect of inclusion, inclusive language is um, making sure that most of our words are gender neutral. Um, use words that encompass all genders rather than just two, because there are more than two genders. Um, for example, um, saying people of all gender versus men and women, children instead of boys and girls, siblings instead of brothers and sisters. Um, and it's simply not okay anymore to address a large group of people with the word guys or dude. And I admit, like, dude is a hard one for me because I live in California. You know, like, everything is dude. But if some people are offended by it, let's just drop that from our vocabulary. Um, we can say folks. We can say staffed. We can say... Um, you know, anything else. You know, it's going back to that defaulting to neutral language. Um, and this one gets me a little bit, and it's mostly me. 
While mansplaining is an actual thing, it's not gender neutral. So make sure we use words like gaslighting or condescending and things like that, you know, just to kind of put things into perspective. And then let's eliminate using the word colored when describing people. You know, um, people of color is a widely accepted umbrella term. Um, gypped comes from the word gypsy, which um, refers to Romanian people who sometimes were characterized as uh, swindlers and, um, and thieves. Ghetto, it's another one some of us use a lot, um, is suspected to derive from the Italian word for garbage. And it kind of goes back to the concentration camps. Um, so when we use a word like ghetto, sometimes classism and racism come into the conversation, you know, ghetto blaster. So there's words that are in our everyday language that some people, you know, they, they, they mean different things to different people. And there's also the idea of privilege in our language. Um, we can't assume everyone has a certain level of education, even in tech. You know, we can't assume that everyone's gone to college. We can't assume that everyone's graduated from high school. And we can't assume that everyone's going to graduate from high school. Um, we can't assume that everyone's employed. Um, as the internet opens up to more people, we enter the realm of having this world stage. Um, English as a second language is a privilege. So keep that in mind. And on that note, which I usually do at the beginning of my slides, and I forgot today, Google Slides, and I know a lot of people hate on Google Slides, there is this button down here for closed captioning. So you turn this little button on and Google Slides will give you some captioning. So this is really good in meetings, like say someone in your meeting is in Argentina and Eng English isn't their native language, you can turn on this caption and that might help them parse out some of what you're saying. In a presentation like this, it doesn't do a lot of good because the font is inaccessible, but I love showing that feature. And then what's nice about it too is it moves the screen up so if, if like Kevin comes back later and adds captions, it doesn't cover up, but then you'll have two sets of captions. But that's a good um, uh, uh, avenue for uh, helping people who might read better or uh, nat aren't native speakers. So us as content, is there any good tools for the inclusive language, like a grammar link? But yes, and I will talk about those. Yes. Um, as content designers and authors and coders, um, we need to go beyond empathy and include the community as our participants in, in the experience. Um, people are hungry to be a part of the process. We don't want to be left behind. We don't want people to visit our website and leave first page. The whole point of our website is we have call to actions. We want them to follow through on those. So what can we do? We can um, create article copy, which is more inclusive. Um, we can start by use, this is more in the accessibility realm. We can make sure that we have a clear hierarchy with our structure. We use headings. I'll go into those in a little bit. We break up our content into easily digestible chunks. We don't want huge walls of text where some people will you know, not be able to scan through that. We want to use short sentences and paragraphs. We want to use bullet points and numbered lists. We want to use images and diagrams and multimedia to visually represent what content we have and to reinforce the ideas on the page. I lost my cursor. There it is. According to usability.gov, uh, we want to write at the ninth grade level, and that's in the United States. In the UK, we want to drop that down to nine-year-old reading level. There are instances like white papers and tech papers where that isn't the case, but in like your general copy, you want to make sure that you write more towards that ninth grade level. Uh, the standard um, ideal is no more than 20 words per sentence and five sentences per paragraph. We want to use plain language when we can. Microsoft Word has a readability statistics feature that built in with a speller and grammar check. There's the Hemingway app. There's the Flesh Kincaid app. 
Of course, again, and I'm going to iterate this several times, there are exceptions because some of us are writing technical documentation. But when we parse through that, if you have a word like navigate, you can shorten that to go. That makes your sentences shorter. Little things. So let's look at the way we enter our content because this is important because this is beyond the code part of accessibility. Headings are not for style. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> Headings are not for style. They have a function and people who rely on adaptive devices depend on consistent and predictable heading structure. Headings are not for style. If you like the way a certain heading looks, talk to your designer. Do not just put it in because you think the purple looks good after the orange. Um, and it's easier for uh, consuming our information too, because I don't know about you, but I don't read anymore. I scan, you know, so having those headings in a hierarchy hierarchical order really helps me to scan to see what information. I scan to a CT, I scan to the next button, I scan to the bottom. You know, I'm going towards that. H1s are the most important, H6s are the least important, and they're nested like an outline that we did in school. Again, heading structure works much uh, like an outline. You can see that they're nested. A 2 is always under a 1, a 3 is always under a 2. Same thing here. There's an app called Ally, what's the rainbow one? Oh, um, Totally. Totally. T-O-T-A-1-1-Y. And you press a button and it will pop out this on the screen for you. It'll do your nested headings and it will tell you where your mistakes are. It's a great app for all sorts of different things. It's a browser extension. I use it in Chrome. I'm not sure if it's available in any other one. WYSIWYGS. We all love WYSIWYGS. So there's, there's a lot of schools of thought, but I'm going to talk about two of them. I'm going to talk about the bare minimum WYSIWYG, which before a couple of months ago I really liked because there was no way anyone could break anything because there was nothing to it. And then there's the WYSIWYG where you give them all the things, right? So the first one, and like I said, I was a firm advocate for this one for a long time, that styling is for coders and not content authors, you know? Um, what you allow your editors to modify could affect your accessibility down the line. So it's like stick to style sheets, stick to, to, to um, style guides, restrict them to certain theme options. Um, allowing someone to throw a div in. You know, that's sort of Harry Ballpark there. Um, my idea was like that design was all about consistency, and so allowing editors to go in there and kind of mess that up was sort of a recipe for ruining it. Like I said, I thought everything should go into those style sheets. So look at this WYSIWYG. This is kind of the bare bones one, right? You've got a bullet, you've got some indentation, you've got a code, a blo block quote, HTML, pretty simple. And then you've got this one, like I don't even know what all this stuff does. You know, there's a calendar, there's, you know, changing your hover state designs, there's, you know, bold, italic, font size, different styles. So there's that. Recipe for disaster, maybe, maybe. So my friend Donna over here schooled me on this, that our communicators and our content editors are active participants in our website. Many times we finish building the websites and it's them who are in there day to day. They're in there creating the content. They're in there really creating the user experience. So if we train our developers and our coders for accessibility, we really need to design, we need to have those same mechanisms in place for our communicators and our content authors and our copy pasters too. So what can we do? We can set up WYSIWYGs that they're encouraged to use. We could put tool tips in where they're like, well, we don't know what that button is. So you hover and there's a tool tip and it shows them what they do. And they're accessible from the start. Um, yeah, because I'm not a content creator necessarily. And what they do when they paint their pictures with their words, you know, it, it, like I said, it's just, if we, if we design, if we, train our designers and coders, we need to 
you know, really take that effort into the into the into the end users as well. Um, I'm just going to kind of breeze through these. So we have these uh, pieces of copy that we have every day, and these are just kind of quick examples. So I'm talk about hiring practices. So the words that we use in our equal employment opportunity statements, they appear in our job listings on our career page. We want to make sure that they're words that we live by, and they're also words that the candidate will measure you by. But they're only meaningful if they speak the truth, right? So using words like young or clean shaven can exclude some people from wanting to apply to your company. Like I'm 44 and like I have the one whisker, but like when I see clean shaven in there, it's like, hmm, maybe they're not looking for me. Um, so this is sort of an example of, of gendered language and something. Um, we want to make sure that our events are accessible um, and that they're advertised as friendly for everyone. Um, be sure to include a contact form so people can let you know if they need something. Don't make it up to them to reach out to you because it might not happen. Um, do people need special accommodations? Is there a gender neutral bathroom? Is there a place where a mother can nurse her child in private? Um, are we supporting our folks with neurodiversity? Is there a window that can be opened? Is there low lighting? Is there a place that they can go with not a whole lot of stimuli? Um, is the venue accessible? Are there wheelchair ramps? Can they drink from the drinking fountains? Can they enter the bathrooms? Um, can they make it down to the smoking area? Little things like that. And ask about dietary restrictions because that's often an afterthought at venues too. And that's very inclusive. Presentations, we're gonna go back to like those four broad parameters of what makes things accessible. So we wanna make it easy to see. So we want folks in the back of the room to see our slide decks too. So we use fonts that are big enough. We wanna make sure our color contrast is appropriate. We wanna make sure that even in a small room, that folks who are sitting behind someone else can see your words. So leaving this space here blank is a good idea. That's also a good place for the captioning to go afterward. So I recommend leaving the bottom sixth of your slides empty. Um, we want to make sure that um, we provide transcripts and captions whenever possible on our presentations. Um, we want to make sure that we speak into microphones and make sure that everyone can hear. So asking people, can you hear in the back of the room? We want to address um, visually induced motion sickness. So avoiding rapid slide transitions curly cues and fades and that kind of thing, flashing lights, uh, animations, uh, animated backgrounds and that parallax effect can really leave some of our users behind. That GIF, I think that's what it's called, that's always like playing in the background can be really distracting for some folks. Um, we want to avoid those text-heavy slides. Some people, you know, maybe with dyslexia, they'll have a hard time parsing out this thing. So make sure that you, you know, leave your stuff in bullet points. You have enough space between the letters and the line heights and that sort of thing. You want to make sure that that it's readable, easily to digest chunks. Subtitles are lines of text that we um, that are trans transcriptions or translations, um, and they show up as speech on the screen. You can see up there, um, Amy Pond is talking to the doctor. Um, but we also want to include the oral information that's pertinent to what's going on. You know, um, is there, do you hear the TARDIS in the background? You know, you, and if that's important to the context, you know, make sure that that's in brackets, that, you know, TARDIS noise, dog barking, music playing, laughter. Anything that adds value to the content should be included for those that can't hear it. Captions can be either closed or opened. Opened captions are always on the screen and you cannot change them. Closed captions are the ones that you can turn on and off and you can go back and change later. Captioning has universal benefits as well, universal design benefits because now that oral information is in text and now guess what? 
search engines can find it. So good accessibility is good search engine optimization as well. Captioning, you can see here that this is a picture um, of, well, you can see that the picture didn't load, but at the, the alt text indicates what it is. It's dog walking. You want to provide captions that are succinct and to the point. You want to provide alt text even for events like presentations. If it's relevant, describing the image and making sure that no one's left behind. And this is helpful for any number of folks. This is helpful for people using assistive technology. It's helpful for me, who lives in really rural California, and I have no high-speed internet, so I don't get the picture in time. Lots of people have CSS and the images turned off in their browser. So it has benefits for everyone. Acronyms and abbreviations. So these are problematic for screen readers and they can muddle clarity in general. So you can look at this one, GTM. Some of us think that's, you know, Google Tag Manager. Other ones, Green Tech Media. Some people will think it's, you know, the airport code for Guatemala. So without context, you can leave some people behind. You go to some of these tech talks and you're like, just a beginner, but they're throwing words like, like, I didn't know what ROI meant for a long time. And I'd go to these sessions, I'm like, what the heck is ROI? What is CTR, you know? Having that, just even if you introduce it in that first paragraph or that first sentence, you know, really helps folks out. And again, for screen readers, there is no longer a acronym tag. It's an abbreviation tag. So use an abbreviation tag for for when it's in the WYSIWYG. But um, sometimes adding those periods between the letters will help the screen readers parse it out too and read it as a word versus, or read it as the letters versus the word. Numerums, we all love numerums. My favorite numerum is ally because it's so much fun. A numerum is where you have the first letter and the last word, last letter and the 11 letters are the letters you take out. So in Drupal, internationalization, I18N, you know, Lots of people might not know that, so introducing it like how you would introduce an acronym or an abbreviation um, is super important. Uh, again, if they're unusual, supply a key. Um, I can't remember which is the HTML5, if it's abbreviation or acronym that was deprecated, so I'm sorry, you'll have to look, but, but, but if you have the chance to use those in your, in, your, in, your, in your content, use those. Links should make sense out of context. Without context, sometimes you'll just hear, I don't know if anyone has ever turned on a screen reader, you can have it where it le reads all the links at once. So you know, you're going through the view, Drupal view, they're so nice, you know, and you get to it and it's read more, 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 read more. Well, no one knows where they're going. So make sure that you have that in your, in your code that read more about the title of your article. They need to make sense out of context. And simply noting the URL doesn't give enough context. You know, so if you're, you have a link, make sure you, you're telling them if they're leaving the page, where they're going, what the destination is. And then link text is a lot like alternative text. It should be succinct and um, be displayed consistently through your site. It's a good idea to restrict the length of your text, uh, text li link text to maybe 100 characters or less. And WCAG 2.0 has new standards in the last two years where if your links are not identified by an underline, you have to have two identifiable pieces to make that link accessible. So if it's not underlined, you need two non-color designations. So bolding, italicizing, two if it's not underlined. So the moral of the story is just underline your links, right? I always tell people my favorite themed website is Craigslist, and one of the reasons is the link is underlined. So no one's going to be having me design their website. Social media. So I talk about this because a lot of us, if not all of us, have our phones, and we're looking at our phones day to day. Hashtags. We all love hashtags, right? Um, much like my name, 
we should title camel case them because we want to break up those words in the hashtag. Having that be said though, if your hashtag is short, one word, you can leave it all under case. Um, it comes down to readability. Remember that Twitter doesn't distinguish between, in results, it doesn't distinguish between the I love Twitter with the title case, title camel case, and all lowercase. They'll both bring up the same results. Because now Thatcher is dead. Now that Cher is dead. So this happened a couple of years ago when Margaret Thatcher died. Lots of people thought the internet kind of exploded because like, people were like, oh, Cher is dead. So you can see where a couple of extra keystrokes would have prevented all of that confusion. There's also one that there's therapist. Could be the rapist. You know, that's a pretty bad one to get messed up sometimes. So just, it's, it is a couple of extra keystrokes, but screen readers will parse it out as two words. There'll be more clarity. People will know what you're talking about. But lots of people like emoticons. And you know who likes emoticons a lot? Screen readers, they love emoticons and they will read every single one of them. Every single one of them. So you know in Slack next to your name you have all those emoticons? That assistive technology is going to read every single one of those emoticons. That email subject line and with all those emoticons, they're gonna read every single one of those emoticons. So think of your, I think I have um, an example. Yeah, there's the therapist right there. Um, all those emoticons are going to be read in line. So they're going to read, and then they're going to read the emoticon, and then they're going to read. And so some people are going to get bored. It's going to be cumbersome. And so you're going to lose some of your followers. So if you do want to add emoticons, don't replace them for words. A good, I always tell folks, like, maybe leave them to the end of your, much like the hashtag, leave them to the end of your tweet. That way, if someone leaves, they've get, you've given them all the information and it's just the emoticons they've left for. So. Question. Sure. Is, is that the same with uh, like ASCII emoticons? Like yep. Yeah. Yep. Unless they have it programmed in their assistive technology, but not everyone has that ability depending on the screen reader they have. Can you wrap it in something that will tell the screen reader to ignore it? I don't have the answer to that. Did you hear that, Donna? I heard that. I've never encountered that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if we can customize a, a social media post that way. Yeah. But Twitter does have... You know, I mean, more like on your own website or in an email campaign or something, if you can wrap emoticons or ask you. Yeah, I don't have the answer to that, but I will get that for you. Um, be mindful when you retweet information, too, because if it's... a not accessible the first time. It's definitely not going to be accessible the second time it's tweeted out. So now what, I'm kind of going fast because I know I'm kind of at my, my limit. Um, my favorite part of Chinese food is the fortune cookie. Um, I pulled this quote out about 18 years ago. It says, begin, the rest is easy. And this I use for a lot of things. I have it taped on my external monitor to remind me every day that you just need to start. Little steps, the baby steps. Um, I probably tell this to my kids or my Sunday school kids all the time. Just start, right? Just something just flips and you start. So start by being a good example and a good ally. Um, make sure that your presentations and your copy and your venue are accessible. There are tools available to help with the copy. Um, you can, there's lots of different accessibility checkers uh, and lots of them are free. Readability.gov, the Hemingway app, and I have lots of links at the end with all sorts of different ones for gendered language, one for albeus, ableist language. Um, adding your pronouns to your public profiles um, helps eliminate confusion and normalizes that conversation. Um, and in here, this is a good reminder, in my notes, I have the words preferred pronouns. Well, guess what? They aren't preferred. 
they're just pronouns. So let's leave that preferred part off of pronouns. You know, we always hear people say, what are your preferred pronouns? They're just your pronouns, you know. Um, I'm glad I left that in there, but that's something to think about too. They're just pronouns. Um, and so going back to like, what is that inclusion that we talked about at the beginning? There's inclusion on the community level, there's inclusion on, the, on your personal level, and there's uh, inclusion on the global level. Um, it's doubtful you'll ever be called out for being too considerate, right? Um, oblivious communication is a good way to lose your audience, especially like even just the accessibility part of it. Uh, your message can be hurtful and people feel excluded. So I always tell folks if you can like choose between doing it one way where it harms some people and doing it another way where it harms nobody, why wouldn't you just default to that neutrality? Um, language is powerful. We use it every day. We all make mistakes, you know. Um, but just being mindful of our expressions and mindful of the way we present our information on the screen and being mindful about how everyone needs to access that information. Um, so I'm a hospice nurse by trade. Did I, did I tell you folks that? So I'm a hospice nurse by trade. And I got into tech pretty late in life, maybe 2016. I've been doing some content entry for a, a site of a friend. Whatever story, doesn't matter. Um, so as a hospice nurse, and I'm older, so I experienced like patients and elderly people, people with brain injuries, trying to access information before there were even cell phones, like using computers and you know, using uh, microfiche, anything you can think of. And then when I got into tech and I learned that people can build accessible websites and they can make things accessible <coughs> and inclusive and they don't, was kind of a weird concept to me. So I like to like remind people that we can't always see what other people have going on, you know, and just like that empathy and really thinking about that really helps us move forward as a society into, you know, creating that accessible content. Any questions? Sure. Uh, to answer your question, uh, there's an HTML tag for already hidden, and that will make it not read that. Um, but uh, not, not a question, but just to add, uh, in terms of uh, dyslexia, uh, so I, I have dyslexia, and I can turn off styling, but using fonts that are too swirly will make it like, I'll just not go to you. So, just not to Right. Um, when you were talking about person-first language, um, I'm pretty active in some online disability communities, and there are a lot of schools of thought on that, and some people don't subscribe to that. So just be careful if someone corrects you or tells you how they'd like to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, referred to or spoken about. Mm -hmm. Just call people what they want to be mm -hmm. called. Um, I've seen people argue with them and be like, "Well, someone told me to use this kind of language." No. And just, don't do that. Yeah. I think <laughs> if someone says they want to be referred to as disabled, refer to them as disabled. That's okay. Right. Like, um, so I'm really hard of hearing, and so I am in the deaf community. And when I first got in, I didn't know that, but they like to be called deaf community, you know, it sort of goes against that people-centered language. But I do stress, like, use, pe use language people prefer, so, or ask. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with asking folks. They'd rather have you ask than get it wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. Okay. Thank you.